Hello, and welcome to the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation. Today we're talking about neighborhood violence and the long-lasting trauma on children. The National Press Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to helping journalists cover complex topics with depth and accuracy. We serve journalists in the U.S. and around the world. I'm Sandy Johnson, president of the National Press Foundation. Today we're talking with two journalists from NOLA.com and the Times-Picayune. Reporter Jonathan Bullington and photojournalist Brett Duke are part of a team that won the Carolyn C. Mattingly Award for Mental Health Reporting. Jonathan and Brett are here to describe their award-winning work and how they got the story. So congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having us. So where did the idea for this project come from? Uh, so uh, really twofold. It started with Rich Webster. He and I, I had um, been approached by someone in our newsroom about this opportunity at the University of Southern California's um, Annenberg Center for Health Journalism. They had mm -hmm. a fellowship program. And we had done some work together, including a series that we did on um, issues surrounding kids whose parents are in prison or jail. So mm -hmm. that was sort of in the back of our minds. And we're both former crime reporters. And so we have a lot of experience going to crime scenes and just sort of being uh, struck by how often you see kids on the mm -hmm. other side of the yellow police tape. And we, we both sort of knew that that exposure to violence was having an effect on kids that maybe we don't always see or we don't always want to see. Mm -hmm. And we thought that could be our pitch for the fellowship, that we would look at the kind of chronic exposure to violence and the trauma and what that does to children uh, in New Orleans. And we chose, we decided to choose Central City uh, as a neighborhood uh, to focus on one neighborhood and Central City, as the name suggests, being centrally located uh, seemed like the best idea. Mm -hmm. And how did you build out the team? Well, so once we, um, once we kind of settled on this idea and we started talking to people and um, we spent about a month just talking to folks in the community, introducing ourselves, Rich and I. We rented an office space. Part of the fellowship gave us the opportunity to rent office space at a former uh, grade school. And for the first month, we just met with people in the community and introduced ourselves and talked about the series or the idea, um, you know, advice and what people wanted to see out of something like that and where people went wrong in the past who tried to tackle that topic. And eventually, in those conversations, we, we got hooked up with this youth football team in a park in Central City. And once we did that and realized that the football team could be kind of the foundation of which we build the story, then that's when Rich and Emma came in, or that's when Brett and Emma came in. Brett as a photographer, Emma as our videographer, and the four of us just started um, going to practice in games and, and um, building the series from there. Mm -hmm. Brett, let's bring you into the conversation because, of course, you know, these guys with their pens and pads walking around talking to people is one thing. <laughs> but once you bring out the cameras and the TV, you know, the, vid the video cameras, that's a whole different thing. What was the initial reception for you all when you started talking to people in Central City? The first thing we needed to do was gain the trust of the community. And um, so we began attending all the practices and um, every game. Um, there were times where sometimes I couldn't go to the, af the game, all, um, the, the practice that afternoon all the way, but I would always show up. For even if it was for five minutes, just to show my, my face, to, to start building a rapport mm -hmm. with the community and with the team and with these kids. And the same thing with Emma. She was in. Yeah. The, you know, did that had you got you had to show up. I, I, yep. You had yeah. to. It, we, we, mm -hmm. it was persistent. Mm -hmm. I mean, persistence. We had to be there. Mm -hmm. We wanted to be there. Mm -hmm. And did you have champions in the community? People that that sort of um, understood the value of what you were trying to do. We did. Yeah. Again, I think that was um, the benefit of that month that we spent. Uh, really, Rich and I at the office, um, at the temporary office of ours and meeting with people. Oftentimes we did not bring a notebook. Uh, we would just sit down and have these kind of frank conversations about it. And I think that went a long way to people sort of saying, all right, well, these guys, um, these guys seem legit. Let's try to help them out as best we can. And I think people in the community liked that um, 
we were approaching this from a, a, a health lens, you know, mm -hmm. so we, we didn't set out to demonize the neighborhood or the people in the neighborhood. We were really trying to say that there are some very real um, health impacts uh, in this community, particularly for children, and if we can address those as a community, maybe we can kind of shift momentum. Mm -hmm. I think that went a long way. Mm -hmm. And how big was the team eventually? The s reporting staff? Um, well, the and, yeah, everybody yeah, was, uh, and the, video, well, was the, the visual the side. Four of us, Rich mm -hmm. and I as reporters, Brett the photographer, Emma videographer, and then Haley Carell, our digital strategist, she came mm -hmm. on a little later as we started to kind of hone everything and got to the phase where we were writing stories and thinking about mm -hmm. how is this going to live on the website, um, and of so course, go ahead. Well, mm -hmm. and of course, editors and really the rest of the staff kind of picks up the slack while we go off and do all this work. Mm -hmm. So there were seven of you out of a staff of how many? Uh, well, there's 65 total mm -hmm. journalists, I think, at the mm -hmm. Times Picayune. Wow, that's a real commitment. And yeah. yeah, it was it was five of us for sure were really dedicated. Mm -hmm. The five journalists on this project mm -hmm. and for uh, 10 months. For 10 months, right. And how did the how did the year of reporting and, and doing the visuals, how did that unfold? I mean, did you have a strategy? How did you, I mean, you know, this what we're trying to do here is help other journalists, you know, if they want to try to replicate what you did. But so how did you go about the, the various components? We, uh, so Rich and I, the first thing we did with our uh, fellowship money after we rented the office space is mm -hmm. we, uh, we bought a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. And we wrote a bunch of ideas on the whiteboard, and none of those happened. <laughs> right? <laughs> we erased all of them. Once we found the football team, everything changed mm -hmm. for us. And that's when the four of us, uh, Rich and Brett and Emma and I, that's when we started, again, practice, games, meeting the coaches and the players and their families, and everything kind of branched out from there. Um, so then we started learning all these stories like, you know, um, a woman named Paulette Young whose grandkids were three and seven when they woke up one morning and found their mom mm. um, shot dead on the kitchen floor. And Paulette, we were sitting next to her during one of the games and she's telling us this story and she's telling us about how not long after she knew that the boys needed more help than a grandmother can give and she didn't know where to go. And so she went to the school because that was sort of the only place. And mm -hmm. that served as the kind of starting point to then look at how New Orleans public schools are addressing or are not addressing uh, the role of trauma in the lives of their kids. Or finding another child who had been, um, you know, had witnessed a shooting in a parking lot and the difficulty that that family had finding mental health resources for their son. And so that became the starting point for a larger look at access to mental health care in New Orleans and across Louisiana, you know? So everything mm -hmm. kind of flowed from the stories of these kids and the same with the photos and videos, right? It right. all just came from showing up and being there. Showing up, time. being there. Mm -hmm. And then eventually we were being inviting, invited into their homes. I'd like to start by just telling you that, again, Central City is one of the most historic and culturally significant neighborhoods in New Orleans. New Orleans is known as the birthplace of jazz music and a lot of those founding fathers of jazz came from Central City. Mm -hmm. Mardi Gras Indians, second line culture, all of that stems in many ways from Central City. The neighborhood was also the epicenter of the civil rights movement in New Orleans. Um, so I just want to get that out of the way so that people don't feel like this neighborhood is hopeless. Mm -hmm. um, but it does struggle with high rates of crime and, and poverty and unemployment. Uh, at the last census, 50% of Central City residents lived in poverty. Compare that to the city average of, of 28%. About a third of Central City residents had attended high school but never graduated. Again, comparing to the rest of the city, 18% or so. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about crime in Central City, I think two statistics kind of stand out to us. One, an organization called the Institute of Women and Ethnic Studies did mm -hmm. a survey of children across New Orleans, including uh, some in Central City. So about 42 kids who lived in Central City's primary zip code. And in that survey, 
Uh, one in five had actually witnessed a murder themselves. About a third had witnessed domestic violence in the home. And more than half had someone close to them who had been murdered. Now take that and let's look at this football team. In a 14 year span of past teams, mm -hmm. 28 former members of that team have been killed Remarkable. in that 14 year span. Right. And I know the coach has that list, that handwritten list that he's exactly. kept. I started watching that when, when one of the football players that got killed right, right after the storm. You know, I didn't really think about it. You know, you just know that one of them got killed. Then the next thing you know, another athlete got killed. I'm like, whoa, hold up. And then another one got killed. And then another one got killed. So all of a sudden, I said, hold on, let me start writing this down. So I start putting his name, Joseph Single first, then the rest of them, and so on, so on, so on. Then all of a sudden, over the years, you started finding kids started missing, you know, started communicating with other ball player and high axe player, you know, where's such and such a, oh he, oh, he dead. And I'm like, well, dead. Then I started looking at this picture from 1999. A lot of players started missing. And I'm like, hold up, something ain't right. Since, since 2003 to now, I have lost 28 football players. And now that I got to 28, it started to open people's minds up. It should let the world know, hey man, we're losing a lot of kids. How did you come up with the numbers for the um, violence that you uh, created the heat map from? Uh, the heat map came from, so we pulled uh, New Orleans Police Department calls for service and not all of them, a sampling, it was, I think it ended up being roughly 3,000. And we tried to find violent crime, but also the sorts of things that would generate, you know, lights and sirens, sort of stuff that could be a traumatic experience for a kid, particularly, you know, middle of the night, you hear sirens wailing and cars speeding down the street. Mm -hmm. We took that list of 3,000, uh, we took that list, I should say, and we stripped out everything that didn't fall, didn't come from Central City's zip, uh, boundaries and built that heat map from it. Uh, a gentleman named Ray Koenig uh, helped make that possible for mm -hmm. us. I don't know how he did it. He's, he's a wizard. I <laughs> he just hit some buttons and that happened. It's really cool. It's, sort of, it's another great visual element to go along yeah. with, the, with the photos and, and that the idea, That idea was, Rich and I had that one while we were in Southern California during the fellowship. We started thinking about, when we talk about exposure to violence, how can we show that to people? And that's where we, the idea of that heat map went to be, look at in one year, the sorts of crimes that children are exposed to in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And when you originally found the youth football team, what was the reaction of the coach and the parents, if the parents were there with their kids, to you know the idea that they would become the central sort of storytelling theme for this project? I think the, um, the coach and his wife were skeptical at first, particularly his wife was very um, untrusting of us. She had her family backstory. Um, they had been in the media in the past for some members of her family. Mm -hmm. And so she was very untrusting of the media. And some of the families that we met in those early days and weeks were as well. Um, again, not to belabor the point, but I think what won them over, I know in some instances what won them over, was they kept going to practice and they'd see us there at the start and they'd see us there at the end and they'd see us there at games. And I think that won them over and made them trust that we cared about this as much as they did. And we wanted to do right by them and their children and the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and so slowly but surely, wonderful things started to happen and invitations, as Brett said, invitations into people's homes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the day before Thanksgiving, sure. right? Or over at Paul at They saw our dedication. And I think uh, another thing that, um, that when, when y'all were, when you and Rich were beginning this, the, they, um, they spoke to them about, you know, not putting this whole story on one kid's shoulder. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the team was, it was important. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's a lot of, I mean, to me it's called B-roll, but there's a lot of B-roll of the kids showing them, enjoying themselves, right. hugging the sort of toddlers that were hanging yeah. along the, out, the outskirts, and you know, it, it made it look like a family, which I guess is what the coach was exactly. hoping, right, 
Yeah. And if you saw mm -hmm. Coach Sean, uh, you know, he was, yeah, he was out there teaching, but he always had one of his kids in his arms. He always mm -hmm. was also having to be a father out there, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Not only you know, not only to the team, but to to his own ki kids that were out there mm -hmm. with him. And what what is the coach's personal story? I mean, how did he manage to stay out of trouble or survive the the issues in the neighborhood? Well, there's sort of the two. Um, there's Coach Scott, who's the was the coach of the team there, and mm -hmm. then um, uh, Jerome Temple, better known as DJ Jubilee. He mm -hmm. had been the coach uh, for years, and when he when we talk about um, Jerome Temple. His neighborhood, again, exposed to the same kind of violence that these kids are exposed to, but he had sports as his outlet. That was what he turned to. And then music. He, um, most people in New Orleans know him as DJ Jubilee, uh, one of the inventors of, of bounce music. And so that was his outlet. Um, Coach Sean, um, the same thing, it was, uh, well, I don't know that he had sports so much as as him, I think, being a father uh, and his kids and wanting to do right by his kids uh, is really what kind of propelled him on that path. All right, let's talk about um, the science. How did you guys dive into the science um, of, you know, t of childhood trauma and its lasting impact? We talked to everyone and anyone we could find, and we read anything and anything, everything we could get our hands on. Um, fortunately for us, there are a lot of really smart people in New Orleans who have been kind of at the forefront of this work. You know, had been had recognized trauma uh, and its effects on children, and were working to change things. Mm -hmm. So, academics or government people? Yeah, academics. Mm -hmm. um, when people like. Um, uh, Dr. Denise Shervington, who's the founder of the Institute of Women Eth and Ethnic Studies. That's that organization I told you about that was doing the surveys of kids to find out how often children had been exposed to violence. Uh, Paulette Carter, who's the director of uh, Children's Bureau of New Orleans, mental health provider for children. Uh, Dr. St Stacy Drury, um, who is a uh, child psychiatrist uh, at Tulane University. Mm -hmm. Folks like that we really sat down with and asked them to explain it to us because we knew that the whole series hinged on people understanding the, me the health impacts of trauma on kids. That way there's not this sort of bootstrap narrative of why don't these kids just try harder or why don't their parents try harder, mm -hmm. you know? Once you sort of understand the um, physiological effects of this, then you can kind of, then it all makes sense, I, I hope. And so we really took a lot of time and care to, to try to explain that to people mm -hmm. as best we could. And did you, did you try to explain this to any of the families, the, in the yeah, what it was doing to the children? Yeah, we did. Yeah. I, I think of um, that day we sat with um, the coach, uh, Sean, and his wife, Sheikah, and they were talking about their son, Tuan, and, and kind of making comparisons to their own experiences as kids and having, you know, sort of this short, uh, having sort of a short fuse and, and being quick to, to kind of face off with somebody if they ever perceived slight. And, and I remember Sheikah saying something like, yeah, uh, Tuan, her son, he's just like me. And so we started telling her about how there is a growing body of research that suggests that these sort of effects of trauma can be passed down in the womb and through DNA um, to kids. And I think in the story we had said something, she has this kind of aha moment and goes, oh, Tuan is just like me. Mm -hmm. um, so we did try to um, explain to people early and often. We go back to Hurricane Katrina, the, with the trauma that affected basically the entire community. Even though the kids that we have now were very young when that happened, it still has this kind of reverberation into today um, for families that were homeless for a long time or families where the parent experienced a great deal of distress. And so like the kid may have not been paid attention to when they were very young. So most of our clients are starting off with that as a baseline. And then you add to that 
community violence or domestic violence, which I feel like are two things that are very prevalent within our client base. We could easily say like 95 to 100 percent of our clients have experienced some sort of trauma, whether it was directly to them or indirectly, right? Whether it's secondary, they're hearing about it, they're, they haven't, or if they're just walking down the street and they happen to see something um, that might have taken place or heard something from somebody else about some situation. And it ends up, what we're seeing is it ends up affecting every facet of their life. And Brett, how do you visualize that kind of science. I mean, wh what did you guys do to try to bring that, the um, you know, this sort of flat science to life for the for the readers and viewers? So, yeah, that that th there was a moment when we were visiting with Jair and his um, and his uh, brother Jaron, and who uh, the, uh, and Jair's a. Um, Panther and his older brother. They, the, those two, we were visiting with that family, and Jair, um, Jaron started. Uh, he did a rap about um, his mother, and um, th you talk about somebody. I, you know, I, I knew that moment was 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 so important, and I was, you know, I was trying not to f to shoot it. So, you know, because it, I knew Emma was sitting right next to me videoing. I knew this was a big video piece, you know, but I also knew there was a, a really intense picture here that shows, you know, the trauma, you know, what, what these, what, what, what these, what they have went through. And these are the two that found their um, mother dead mm -hmm. in, in their house. And um, in that one moment, uh, during as Jaron was rapping, um, his grandmother like closed her eyes and, and held her high and, and became emotional. Mm -hmm. Trying to find those little moments during this are so important. Um, they're just it's it's that's that's one of the that's one of the times that I can th that. Those are the types of pictures that I was looking for during this, mm -hmm. um, uh, to see um, how, how this has affected these families. Mm -hmm. And uh, what kind of adjustments did you have to make during the 10 months of working on this project? I mean, lots. <laughs> did you have to do Every any day. like 180s, yeah. or yeah. Well, was I mean, it a, was it really more minor tweaking once you threw away the whiteboard? Yeah, well, mm -hmm. exactly. There was that initial. Um, all of these ideas of maybe this will be a story and maybe that'll be a story. And we'd even gone so far as to interview people thinking, well, that, you know, that maybe that'll be the start of this series. All of that went out the window when yeah. we found the football team. Mm -hmm. But once we found the team, then it really, everything got clear and everything moved. And then it was just sort of the little things that come up in journalism. You know, one um, sort of story that makes me laugh now because we survived it so I can laugh at it. Um, we, Haley in particular, spent a really long time building out the intro for this series and it was really pretty and the idea was because we had spent so much time in that park every day, we really wanted the readers to feel like they were at the park as well. So we built out this really nice multimedia intro that had audio and video and this really wonderful scrolling thing. It, it was, we were mm -hmm. really so proud of it, right? And then the day before all this is supposed to launch, afternoon, late afternoon, it just stopped working. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> and then it blew up, it mm -hmm. just, it broke. And so Haley sat at her desk till, I don't know what time, and rebuilt a new intro that didn't have all the bells and whistles, of course, but um, and of course that just happens, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, right, part of the process. Yeah, something is gonna go wrong and that's what went wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so you spent 10 months collecting all of these images, excuse me, all of this video, all of these notes, all of these statistics. How did you keep track of everything? Were you working in spreadsheets? Were you using Slack? What was your, what was your MO for just trying to, to, to you know, log all of this material so you could figure out how to proceed when you were doing the editorial? Visually, I was, I mean, like after every practice, I would try to sit down and force myself the next morning to edit because, I mean, there was practice every day. We were mm -hmm. there, right? So I would try to edit some of my favorite pictures and pictures that I felt that could or could, you know, be eventually make the edit. Um, I tried the spreadsheet. 
<laughs> it wasn't my cup of tea, but I, I really did. I tried the spreadsheet and trying to log everything. But I, I think uh, what best worked um, visually for me is just to continue this 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 edit day after each mm -hmm. shoot and keep it to its side. Yeah. Um, I wish Emma was here to show you oh, and tell yeah. you about it. Emma kept, <laughs> what was it, like wrapping paper or something? Wrapping paper? Well, not wrapping. It was like a, a roll, big roll of paper. Uh -huh. And she storyboarded the entire oh. documentary uh -huh. that she made. And I know mm -hmm. she brought it in the office one day and rolled it out, and it just stretched mm -hmm. for I don't know how long. And that's how she storyboarded everything. Um, Rich and I kept a, um, a running Google Doc mm -hmm. uh, and after every practice, because we would trade off going to practices, and sometimes we would both go to practice or both go to games, but after every one, we would go in that Google Doc and just write everything that happened and all the notes and all the people we met. We kept another Google Doc of all the sort of sources and community people that we had been reaching out to, and that's how we mm -hmm. tried to manage this over those months. Are there any parts of the project in retrospect that you're very proud of? I mean, this is a question for each of you. I'm most proud of the, the families for, for trusting us and for the kids to have the courage to tell us these stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, ditto. I mean, my favorite part is the, um, towards the end, there's a tab that's uh, players in their own words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's the Emma's wonderful videos. We hosted, um, we used some of our fellowship money to host the team's end of the year uh, banquet mm -hmm. at the school that we had been working out of. And during that event, we would ask the kids if they could come up and uh, in our office, we sat them down and we asked them all the same four or five questions. You know, what do you like about your neighborhood? What don't you like? What could you, what would you change if you could? You know, what do you want to be when you grow up? That sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And Brett's portraits of them and Emma's video and sort of hearing these kids in their own words, I think, was was my favorite. And once this, the uh, project was published, uh, describe some of the impacts that came out of that. Uh, I think worldwide fame, just <laughs> universal acclaim and praise. Doing a global tour. Yeah. You're right. Mm -hmm. the, the internet comments were overwhelmingly positive. Mm -hmm. um, no. Uh, so th it was really quite nice to see the immediate impacts, people reaching out, wanting to help the kids and the team. Mm -hmm. Things like, I know someone paid to have the kids go to a Saints football game. They all got together and got to go. And some other people um, had some fundraisers uh, so the kids could have um, equipment and things. So that was really nice to see. And then there were some sort of bigger things. The, so I think the series came out in June and the next month, uh, the city council, New Orleans city council, uh, two different meetings, they're two um, yeah, meetings back to back, they introduced resolutions. The first one asked, called on all New Orleans public schools to adopt trauma-informed approaches. The second one created this task force that was given one year to uh, study and come back with recommendations for all the ways in which the city can be better trauma-informed and, and kind of address the role of exposure to violence in the lives of kids. Uh, I want to say that task force is expected to make its final recommendations in the next couple months. Yeah. Well, let's talk about this um, trauma-informed learning approach. Mm -hmm. Is it something that's done elsewhere in the country? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, um, oh boy, there's schools in, I know there was couple in California, I think Washington State, um, Philadelphia. So yeah, it, it exists places. This is not a new thing, mm -hmm. uh, these trauma-informed collaborators. In New Orleans, it started as a uh, effort of the city's health department with Tulane University and um, Institute of Women and Ethnic Studies, Children's Bureau, some of these other organizations. They all partnered together for five schools to mm -hmm. kind of start um, transforming the day-to-day -day practices into being a little more trauma-informed. All in Central City? No, or no, across no. the city? Yeah, it was okay. across the city, mm -hmm. these five schools. And then they added a different kind of grant um, called Safe Schools NOLA. That expanded to uh, six other schools. Mm -hmm. So it was 11 schools doing that work, and I understand that there, there are some more grant dollars in the way to kind of 
branch out even further to, again... You know what the grants are from? Is it, are they federal grants? Yes. Or? The mm-hmm. the Safe Schools and the Trauma-Informed Collaborative, I think there's federal dollars there. I know for mm-hmm. sure Safe Schools NOLA was some federal money. You don't know what department, do you? I want to say it was NIJ, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was federal dollars to to do this work. And what exactly is a the Trauma-Informed Learning Collaborative? What does it do? Yeah, so... Um, what they would do is they'd, they'd have somebody who would uh, work with a school, you know, designate somebody in that school, uh, head guidance counselor or the principal, and they were to take a look at, you're essentially looking at all of the systems in your school and figuring out, when we think about it from the lens of trauma, how can we do this differently? So we know, what does that look, what does trauma look like in a classroom? You have kids who you know, maybe have trouble focusing, concentrating in class, Mm -hmm. they're quiet, head down, chewing on their nails, things like that. Or maybe it's something like a kid walks in the hallway and someone accidentally brushes against a shoulder and the kid reacts kind of aggressively to that. Because that constant exposure to violence and the trauma that comes with that, uh, a kid's fight, flight, or freeze mechanism is Mm -hmm. always activated. Mm -hmm. So they're always perceiving danger even where it doesn't exist. Mm So then if you look at a school and you have these really harsh discipline policies, so a kid um, kind of jumps when something happens and you say sit still and you yell at that kid, well, that's not really going to, that's not going to work. Or the kid's not paying attention and you, you know, you, you match that with aggression. Um, it may not have the best, the best outcome. So how does that play out in like these general practices in the school? Uh, One school I know, they would do something really simple, which was the kids would have a card, and it was like a color-coded card. And all the kid has to do, as you and I are sitting here, kind of slide that card out on the desk, and the teacher knows, okay, you need need a break. Mm -hmm. And the kid can go to, they had a teacher's lounge that they kind of converted into this wellness center, sort of spa-like in its design. So the kid can, relax and regroup and calm down and, and regain focus. Um, another school had sort of a meaningful Mondays approach. So those are kind of the day-to-day things that they would do. Also just thinking about discipline policies. Mm-hmm. You know, a child acts out in class, do you immediately suspend that child or do you do something a little different? Um, that's sort of how they the approach they took. Mm-hmm. And what, what um, if journalists were trying to do a similar project like this in their own community, um, what suggestions do you have for them, you know, both of you? Um, I think the most, in one of the most invaluable things that came from this or for us was that month we spent, no notebooks, Rich and I just meeting people and talking to them. You know, that's where we learned things like, don't make one kid carry the narrative weight of this. That's mm-hmm. how we found mm-hmm. that football team. Mm-hmm. All of that um, came because of that month we spent. And that can be really scary, I think, for reporters. We're so used to, I need an outline and I need to see what the stories are gonna be. Mm-hmm. And it's, <coughs> it feels a little bit like you're you know, without a net here. Mm-hmm. But in the end, it, it really um, yeah. paid off. Take out all those formulas and preconceived notions um, that the pictures that you're looking for, and wad it up and throw it out, and be a and, and be ready to be a good listener. Um, and you know, I thought you know, um, don't let, don't be afraid to let the community guide, mm-hmm. to guide us. All right. Um, anything else that you wanted to add? Thank you for having us. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. All thank right. you for this. So our thanks again to Jonathan Bullington and Brett Duke, who are with their colleagues from New Orleans, are winners of the Carolyn C. Mattingly Award for Mental Health Reporting. Resources from this tutorial will be posted for your use on MPF's website at nationalpress.org, where we make good journalists better. <laughs>